Got your eyes on a home? You need local home loan experts. You need guaranteed rate affinity. We've made your way home simple and seamless with the best technology designed to get you home fast. Like closed in as fast as 10 days fast. Ready? Talk to your Coldwell Banker Realty agent and your guaranteed rate affinity loan officer will get you on the fast track. Nice, great day. Uh, this is uh, Frank Chardelli. I'm the Senior Vice President of uh, Sales at uh, Guaranteed Rate Affinity. It is great to have you on with us. Uh, it is a, a beautiful uh, President's Day, February 20th, and uh, really excited to have all of you uh, take your time out today. Uh, we have a great hour of, of amazing content. So hopefully, if, for those of you that are uh, doing a viewing party right now, or those of you that might be at home or in the office, get out those notebooks. There's gonna be amazing gold nuggets that we're gonna share with you. Um, Barry, uh, we were just doing a little bit of a talk earlier um, and uh, really looking forward to some of the opportunities and outlook that Barry's gonna be providing for you. But uh, you know, really quick, wanted to talk to you about uh, Guarantee Rate Affinity um, and why we do these kind of things at Guarantee Rate Affinity. Uh, in terms of having uh, great guests on like Barry. And it's really just goes, uh, goes apart to, you know, how we really wanna make sure that our loan officers around the country are that trusted advisor. For those of you that are in the real estate community, for our borrowers, our clients, uh, and making sure that uh, they have that knowledge to go back to you and help you, uh, you know, go back to your clients and your borrowers and make sure that we're all articulating some great positive uh, showing loan officers our realtors and our borrowers opportunities. Um, and education is a massive part of what we do here. Um, so your loan officers at Guaranteed Rate Affinity are always a great um, source of you getting some information. We work with Barry Habib and the MBS uh, team as well, MBS Highway team to make sure that every day we're getting amazing content to share with you as our realtor partners. But uh, with that being said, Barry, if you want to come back in, I uh, would love to do an introduction to Barry. Uh, definitely uh, someone that over the years that has really built up a massive trust and following of loan officers from around the country, helping us articulate to you know our referral sources and our borrowers, you know really what's going on in, in the in the world. And since we've been doing these calls, we've been you know really fortunate to sort of gauge as to the success of, of Barry's, uh, you know, forecast. And it's, it's pretty remarkable. Uh, and, you know, I'm going to go through some of these notable awards that, that Barry has, uh, uh, has won and talk about that crystal ball award uh, for three years in a, in a row. Uh, you know, we keep saying in our industry, God, I wish we had that crystal ball. Well, Barry has won that crystal ball three years in a row. And it's, it's really great to see in 2019, Barry was the mortgage professional of the year. Uh, Barry was also the finalist for the Ernst & Young Entrepreneur of the Year, named to Mortgage Global 100 list, uh, and the St. Armand Ventures Businessman of the Year in 2021. So Barry, there's like a lot more to go and dive into you. Uh, we really appreciate your time, uh, you know, with uh, speaking to us. And maybe we'll have some time for questions a little bit later on. So for those of you that if you do have questions, please feel free to put them in the, uh, the question feature in the GoToWebinar. And we'll see if we can call some out towards the, uh, the back of the call. But Barry, uh, thanks for joining us and uh, looking forward to the next 55 minutes. Frank, it is a, an honor and a privilege to be here with Guaranteed Rate Affinity. And to all you wonderful people here, I know that I'm um, just looking here, well over a thousand logins, which with the watch parties, it's probably close to 2,000 people uh, that have joined. So thank you. Thank you so much, uh, especially it's a holiday today. So taking your valuable time and paying attention to this is uh, is wonderful. So what we're going to do is we're going to talk about a lot of things today that are on people's minds. So what's going on with the housing market? Because a lot of your customers are scared. They're hearing in the media that there's a housing bubble. In fact, you know what? If you were to take a look on Google Trends, like what terms are trending, what are people thinking about, it's housing bubble, it's inflation, it's the Fed. And when we think about things like this, what a wonderful softball that gets thrown to us that we can just hit a home run with if we can answer the questions correctly. 
So today, if a real estate agent gets from their customer, which they're going to get every single time, what's happening? Is this a good time to buy? Are home prices going to go down? Is there a bubble? How are you answering that question? Are you giving them the right insights to unequivocally, correctly respond to that and put their fears to rest? Or like the vast, vast majority, 99.9% .9 of agents out there saying, well, you know, the housing market seems pretty good. That isn't going to cut it. Look, we know that the markets change. There's fewer transactions in some markets. There's more real estate agents than there are sales available. So how do we gain market share? How do we rise above our competition? The clear answer is with knowledge. You know, sales is one thing and it's important. But when you're a consumer, do you really want a salesperson? You know, we can smell that. Or do you want somebody who's really giving you insights and advice on this transaction, which is a very big investment for people, maybe their largest investment. So we're going to do that today. We're going to go very deep. I'm going to take you places that no one else has taken you to. I promise you that. I'm going to show you how to understand the housing market, how to understand interest rates. Just one thing I ask of you is you dedicated the time to this. So just please, everything will make sense to you. I promise if you're focused. Okay. So maybe take some notes, uh, put your phone down, let, let the phone just sit for the next 55 minutes to an hour. Just let it be without you. And we're going to go through this together. So first things first is let's understand what drives prices is supply and demand, right? We know that. Now, the demand side of housing is going to be influenced greatly by interest rates. So if we want to understand what's going to drive housing, we want to understand the direction of interest rates. And if we want to understand interest rates, we need to know what is actually driving them. Now, if you ask maybe 9 out of 10, 19 out of 20, maybe 95 out of 100 people what drives mortgage rates, oftentimes they'll say the Fed. It's not true. The Fed influences a lot of things. The Fed influences personal loans, credit card loans, car loans, consumer loans, home equity lines of credit, business loans. Yes, Fed has influence. But interestingly enough, not when it comes to mortgage rates. When the Fed hikes rates or cuts rates, mortgage rates do not respond to that. In fact, they oftentimes respond in the opposite direction. Like, for example, in the last two and a half months, the Fed's hiked rates one and a half percent. So the Fed's gone up 100, 1.5%, but mortgage rates have come down by 1%. So we know it's not the Fed. What is it? It's inflation. Inflation is what drives mortgage rates. So let's talk about what's happening today, and I'm going to explain why inflation drives mortgage rates. And let me give you that first example right now. Let's say that you gave me a mortgage, and every month I make you a fixed payment for a long period of time, right? That's what happens when you pay a mortgage. You're making fixed payments over a long period of time. Let's just say you get $2,000 a month. You take that $2,000 a month today and you get a shopping list of goods and services with that $2,000. Next month you get the check and you get everything again. Check, check, check. You got it all on that shopping list again. You get everything. Maybe the third month you do, but over time something starts to happen, right? Over time what you discover is I can't get everything on that list. Why? Well, you know because inflation is driving prices a little bit higher, making some things cost more. So that $2,000, the check still says $2,000. It just doesn't feel like $2,000, right? It doesn't buy as much as it used to. So what's happening, inflation is causing the buying power over time to erode. Now, there's nothing you can do about that loan that you gave me, right? So when you gave that to me, maybe inflation was very low, so the erosion was very small. A year or so ago, the inflation was like 1%. But now, with inflation having moved up, on new mortgages that you're going to be doing, because that's the business you're in, you're issuing mortgages, you have to think about the fact that, well, inflation's higher, that means that buying power is going to be eroded more rapidly, so the only defense you have is to charge a higher rate. So on a similar mortgage that you give out, instead of collecting $2,000 a month, maybe you want $2,300, $2,400 a month, and that helps protect you from the more rapid erosion that's occurring, so it offsets that, and it's that simple. So we know this. We know that when inflation goes up, mortgage rates go up. When inflation comes down, mortgage rates come down. Pretty simple. And that's a very important foundation for what we're going to talk about today. And you probably right now know much, much more than any of your counterparts out there. Here we go in the first two minutes. So let's see a lot of this stuff in action. So I'm going to share my screen here because I think what's very important for us folks is it's, it's very important for us to understand that this truly is the opportunity that you've been waiting for 
in housing. Uh, and I'm going to break this down as to why this is a great opportunity right now. Now, there's a lot of negativity. There's no doubt about it. You see it in the media all the time. And I don't know if you saw this article that was an American banker saying, hey, is it, is it time to quit mortgage and real estate? Really, is it time to quit? Well, they cite all things in the article. And then this article, they say, you know, that we're seeing refinances down 80%. We're seeing purchase volume down 40%. Overall volume of mortgage applications are down 50 to 60%. Okay, so look, all that's true. But is there an opportunity? And are things going to get better? Well, let's take this step by step. So the first thing I explained to you is that inflation, not the Fed, drives mortgage rates. Well, here's a good example. The pink line here is inflation and the blue line is mortgage rates. Now, notice what happens over the years. As inflation rises, see, mortgage rates rise. When inflation comes down, mortgage rates come down. When inflation goes sideways, mortgage rates go sideways. Even this little blip here, mortgage rates follow with their own little blip up. So they're very closely related. Now, the shaded area see here, that was the recession. You know, a lot of people forget that in January of 2020, we had a recession. So the recession began and then two months later, oh my gosh, pandemic. So we got a double whammy there. So here comes the Fed. Now the Fed tried to cut rates and they brought rates all the way down to zero, but that still didn't stimulate the economy. So what they did was they really went crazy and they did something you may recall the term quantitative easing or QE. So what is that? That's actually the Fed Forget about cutting rates or hiking rates, right? The Fed cut rates to zero, but then they wanted to do more. So they then started physically purchasing, buying bonds, buying treasuries, buying mortgage bonds. They used their balance sheet to do that. So what they did was they had a target of here's 3% over to the left in mortgage rates. And notice that during this bracketed quantitative easing period, this blue line of mortgage rates, they kind of tried to keep mortgage rates around 3%, not just by cutting interest rates, because that wasn't doing it, they were buying the mortgage market. They were actually buying mortgage bonds enough to put them at 3%, so very different. Now, in the beginning, when mortgage rates were at three, inflation was at one, that was okay. But then starting something started to happen, as you might notice here, this pink line, inflation started to go way up. It started to shoot up very quickly. But what did the Fed tell us? The Fed said, don't worry about it because it's transitory. And then when it continued higher, well, then the Fed finally woke up and they said, hey, this is from your Fed chair. He said, Jerome Powell, he goes, we now understand how little we understand about inflation. That's not very comforting from the most important man in the financial world, right? So not understanding inflation. You're going to understand it in a minute a lot better. So as inflation rose and when the Fed said, hey, we're going to stop buying the mortgage market and mortgage rates are going to now move freely. What did mortgage rates do? The second they stopped, well, mortgage rates began to do what they always do, follow inflation. Inflation went up, mortgage rates went up. In the summer, when inflation came down, mortgage rates came down. And then inflation shot back up in late summer, early fall, mortgage rates shot up. And then at the later part of the year, at the end of 2022, inflation started coming down into 2023. And mortgage rates, not in a straight line, of course, they have made a move lower. So you could see how closely the two behave. So we talk a lot about inflation, right? Let's, let's understand what is inflation. So what is it? Inflation is simply too many dollars chasing too few goods. Now, you know this with everything in real estate. When there's too many buyers with money, with dollars available, and there's too little inventory, it pushes prices higher, right? So when we think about it with anything, used cars last year, too many people able to have money for used cars and not enough used cars or new cars on the market. Remember you were paying over sticker value, right? All that stuff. We know that from cars to homes to heck, even toilet paper, right? During the pandemic, people would have paid anything for that because it was a shortage. So when too many people could buy it and there's not enough of it, it drives the price higher. That's inflation. Now, here comes the Fed. They say there's too much inflation out there and it's the Fed's job to control it. It's, it's amazing, right? Because the Fed was printing the money before, now they gotta vacuum it up. So how do they do that? Well, it should be noted that of all the money out there, 80% of it is credit. I, mean, I just want you to think about that. 80% of the money is credit. So the Fed can't really touch the money you have that's not credit, but what they can do is they can affect credit. They can influence credit. They can discourage you from borrowing if they make rates higher and more expensive, but they can also do something 
It's called demand destruction. That's interesting. And let me give you an example. Now, some of you might have a home equity line of credit. Some of you may know someone who's had a home equity line of credit. And over the past seven or eight months, they have seen the monthly payment that they have to spend on that home equity line of credit skyrocket. Maybe they were spending $300 a month on a home equity line of credit seven months ago, but today that's jumped up to eight or $900 a month. Now, if a family is receiving fixed payments like a salary, then that increase that they have to pay is more of their take-home pay has to be allocated not towards buying anything new, but simply servicing that home equity line of credit. Now, when they do that, that leaves less money for them to do things like go out to eat, buy clothing, things of that nature. So that family then spends less money on new things, and that's how the Fed fights inflation. You know, another way to look at it is businesses with the Fed funds rate going up so much, their payments are based on that. Those businesses both have to spend more money on existing debt and are discouraged from new debt. Here's another example you might relate to. Let's turn back the clock seven or eight months. And a family says, hey, you know what? I want to buy a beautiful new car. So they go to the dealership and they say, how much is it? The price is $60,000. Now, how do we buy things in this country? Do we buy it by price or we buy it by monthly payment? Well, they buy it by monthly payment and the monthly payment is $600 a month. Now, family says, okay, 600 bucks a month. I'll take it. They get the keys, but they don't spend any money. You see, they just sign and drive away. Now, somebody had to give the dealer money or the seller money. How does that happen? Well, at a bank, somebody makes a few magical keystrokes and boom, poof, out of thin air, $60,000 appears. Now, imagine this happens 5 million, 10 million times a year. And wow, you've got hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of billions of dollars created out of thin air. So what is inflation? Too many dollars chasing too few goods. So there's a lot of money being just created. So when the Fed comes in and the Fed says, hold on a second, we're going to start hiking rates. And they've brought the Fed funds rate up to, from zero to let's call it 5%. Things changed. Now, imagine the neighbor of that person who bought that beautiful car. They say, hey, that's a nice car. Where'd you get it? And they point them to the dealership. So now when they go to the dealer, they say, I like that same car, same color. What's the price? Oh, it's the same price. Great. But now that the Fed's raised rates so much, when they ask the magical question, how much does it cost per month? It's not 600, it's now 1,000. So you know what that family might say? Hmm, maybe I'll drive the car I have a little bit longer. So there's no magical keystroke and there's no poof, $60,000 that gets created. Multiply that millions and millions of times and you start to see the amount of dollars out there shrinking. Very important for us to understand this because that is specifically what the Fed is trying to do. So what do we know? That when the Fed hikes rates, borrowing slows or more money has to go towards servicing debt. So some of the money is coming out of the system. It's getting closer to balanced, but something else is happening. And you may have noticed this too. Six or eight months ago, if you went to put money in a savings account, in a CD, uh, short-term bonds, you couldn't get any kind of return. It was less than 1%. So people say, heck, if I'm not going to get anything for saving it, I'll spend it. And that's more money in the system. But today it's different. Just seven or eight months later, the Fed's hiked so much that now you can get a real rate of return. Heck, 5% on bonds, 4% of savings rate. So when the Fed hikes, people say, instead of spending it, I'll save it. So that takes money out of the system. And something else has happened over the last eight months. We have seen the supply chains. China's opened up. Our supply chains are fine. And now we've got a lot more goods. In fact, you could argue we've got too many goods. You could see it in levels of inventory at shelves on stores. Before the pandemic, inventory was building and then we had the pandemic. So all the supply chain was shut down. So inventory on shelves was gone. Remember that? You couldn't find anything. Then we started to get our supply chain back, but then China shut down. China was very important because all those tanker ships that would normally come out of places like Shanghai. There were thousands of them. Each one of those ships that was stuck, that couldn't come out because of the shutdown, might have had 10 or 12,000 containers. What's a container? Just one container is what you see on the back of a big truck you pass on a highway, those big tractor trailers you pass. That's one container. 
imagine 10 or 12 thousands of, of them on a thousand ships, each waiting for China to open up. Well, as China started to open up in the fall, what happened? Goods started to flow, and now we have overstocked inventory. And when you've got a lot of inventory on the shelves, it goes on sale. That's why you're seeing every day discounts, inventory. So as prices come down because of that, it helps inflation to come down. Now, let's understand, if we know inflation is so important, how do we forecast inflation? So here we're going to get a little bit deep, but I know you're going to be able to handle it because I'm going to explain it to you and go through it with you in a way that 100% you're going to get it. So just stay focused. Okay. So how do we measure inflation? One of the ways that's most popular to measure inflation is called the Consumer Price Index, also known as CPI for Consumer Price Index. So the Consumer Price Index, or CPI, it measures what is a typical basket, a shopping basket of goods and services that people would need. It then takes that basket of goods and services, and what it does is it measures the change of what it cost month over month, and then when you get 12 months, it's able to calculate how much did it change to buy the same basket today that it cost a year ago. And the difference is the rate of inflation. So for argument's sake, if it cost a year ago $100 and today it's $110, well, that's a 10% rise and the year-over-year -year rate of inflation is 10%. It's that easy. Now, when you take a look at that rate of inflation over the CPI, there's something else called the core rate of inflation, which is more important. So what is the core rate? What's the difference? At its core, it takes away prices for food and energy. And it says, what is that basket minus food and minus energy? And let's measure the change in that one. Now, at first you might say, well, Barry, hold on a second. Uh, isn't that kind of silly? I need food. I need energy, right? Yes, we know that, of course. But here the Fed, is looking at what it can influence with their monetary policy. If they hike rates, if they cut rates, that they can influence this rate of inflation. Food prices, for example, this bird flu, egg prices, have you noticed egg prices going up? If the Fed hikes rates or cuts rates, it's not gonna affect the bird flu, right? So that's why they take food prices out because food is often governed by weather conditions too. So the Fed can't affect the weather. Energy prices are gonna be pipeline disruptions, OPEC produces more, they produce less, what, these are things that Fed hikes or cuts are not going to influence. So the Fed looks at the core rate because they believe that they can influence this rate of inflation with monetary policy. So that's why. Again, you know more than 99% of people out there based upon this too. So let's see what that might look like. I'm going to take a snapshot in time. And I'm going to choose May of 2022 as the snapshot that we're looking at. So if we're in May of 2022, at the end of May, in early June, you get the report for May of what the rate of inflation was for that one month compared to April. But when you take a look at May of 2022 compared to June of 2021, and you take these 12 months and you add them together, what you get is a year-over-year -year rate of 5.8%. So May of 2022 compared to May of 2021, inflation went up 5.8%. And that's made of 12 individual monthly changes added together to give you this rate. Now, mortgage rates, interestingly enough, were pretty close to that. They don't always ride along with it. We don't. It's not that these are tied together in the same rate, but the, it's the change direction. If this goes up, you'll see mortgage rates go up. If this core CPI goes down, inflation will go down. So what do we know? When inflation goes up, mortgage rates go up. When inflation comes down, mortgage rates come down. So in May of 2022, this was the rate of inflation. But then we got the June number. So in June of 2022, this number comes out early July. It comes out and it says the rate of inflation in June was six tenths of a percent. So now we have actually a new number for June. So what does it replace everybody? June of 2022 has to replace June of 2021, right? So it says now these 12 months, and when we get that, you replaced, June of 2021 was seven tenths, replaced it with a lower number of six tenths. So obviously that made the year over year inflation rate go from 5.8 down to 5.7, because now I'm adding these 12 instead of these 12, right? And when inflation came down, notice how mortgage rates came down. So they're gonna move together. 
Now, a lot of people were saying back here in June, they said, hey, you know what? Inflation's peaked. We're going to see inflation come down now. That's it. All clear. I was one of the only voices in it, whether you, you know, watched many of my videos or in media or whatever. If you heard me back then say, I'm sorry, but I disagree. I think it's going to be a terrible summer. It's going to be a cruel summer. You're going to have a lot of heartburn and mortgage rates are going to go up, not down over the summer. I also said that it's going to take until October's reading, which we get in early November, for you to start to see mortgage rates go down. But I thought it was going to be a brutal summer. Now, why did I say that? Well, because the Fed just started to get serious in June about making big rate hikes. The day the Fed makes a rate hike, nothing really happens. You know, you, you, you hear about it, but it takes a month for you to see in your statement that the price went up. Another 30 days for you to write the check to actually feel it. And maybe 30 days after that for the behaviors to change. So we didn't think it would be until October that we'd start to see that. Now, back in June, the supply chain in China just started to open up. It takes time for those tankers to get loaded, to come across the ocean, to get here, to be distributed. So we felt it would take until October for that to happen too. So we thought we'd probably have higher inflation in the summer but then with the October reading, it would come down. So we were expecting higher rates of inflation over the summer still. Now, that was our best assumption, but there's something that we knew guaranteed, and here's where I want you to put your thinking cap on. So as we were gonna get the numbers for July, August, and September of 2022, what were they gonna replace everybody? The numbers for July, August, and September of 2021. Now, on a relative basis, you notice something about these numbers? They're very wide. If you're saying low, congratulations, you're 100% right. They were very low numbers. So now what's going to happen if we get persistently high inflation over the summer, replacing lower inflation from 2021, what was going to happen to the CPI? It was going to go up. It was going to go up. And if CPI went up, mortgage rates would go up. And guess what happened? Boom. Exactly that. Higher numbers replaced lower numbers. Inflation went up and mortgage rates went up. Team, this is one of the ways we were able to forecast. But remember, in June, we said when October comes, things would come down. In fact, the October reading was going to come out November 10th. So we said, hey, circle November 10th on your calendar. In June, we said this because we felt that inflation would start coming down then and mortgage rates would start coming down then. Why? Because all the reasons I told you, we thought the Fed rate hikes would start to bite. We thought supply chains would open up. But again, that was a guess. But what did we know for sure, everybody? What did we know for sure over the next few months was going to happen? We knew that October, November, and December, we felt lower numbers would replace what? Those numbers for 2021 were very what, everybody, if you were to take a quick peek at it. What are you saying? Are you saying that those numbers are what? Higher? Yeah. So if lower numbers replaced higher numbers, that would push CPI down and that would bring mortgage rates down. And guess what happened? Exactly that. Lower numbers replaced higher numbers. CPI has come down a lot and so have mortgage rates. Now, this is exactly what we have to be understanding and thinking if we're gonna say, well, how do we understand if housing is gonna get better, if there's gonna be more activity? What are mortgage rates going to do? If we want to understand what mortgage rates are going to do, we have to understand these inflation numbers. And this is what we're going to be looking at in just a moment as we look at these January through June of 2022 numbers that will be replaced with the January through June of 2023. I'm going to come back to this with you in just a minute. But there's a very big influence in these numbers. Housing. Housing which is measured by something they call shelter cost. That's rents and owner's equivalent rent. They consider housing a service. So it's not home values. It's if you're renting, what's the change in rent? And if you own a home, what is the change in what you could rent your home out for? So it's determined by that. So it makes up 43% of this number, 43%. So what's happening with shelter in real time right now? Well, they're going up at a rate of change of 3.3%. This is very important to understand. But remember, it doesn't look at what's happening in real time. There's a big lag. Why? 
because it's counting the past 12 months. Look, just like in the CPI report, when you get year over year CPI numbers, right? You get the CPI number year over year and it's saying, okay, what is what the current month is and counting 12 months back. So it's counting this current month and every single month equally, including what happened 12 months ago. So it's taking all that into consideration. So 43% of it is not just taking what's happening in real time, it's taking all of this last year into account. So it's kind of like an average of this, but it gets worse. Because if you were asked, what are you paying in rent right here? You might have not signed your lease that day. You may have signed your lease back here, six months, eight months, nine months before, four months before. So it's really taking this whole piece into consideration. Kind of like looks like this is what it's pushing in the actual CPI number. So while in real life, rents are going down or at a slower clip, it's showing that it's going up in CPI because it still hasn't gotten through all this information yet. Eventually it'll get there and eventually this will catch up, but right now it's artificially holding up what you see in CPI. So in fact, the difference between the two, if you would do the math, CPI would be around three and a half in close, instead of close to five and a half, which is where it is today. Now, as we take a look and say, okay, what does this look like? It kind of looks like a roller coaster. You know, if you get to the apex of a roller coaster, the front of the roller coaster is going down while the back is still going up. And that's what it looks like. In real time, shelter costs are heading lower, but the way it's affected in CPI is it shows it's still marching higher. Now, It'll start getting to the peak of this and heading down, and I'll show you the exact dates. Around March 14th, all this will start cooperating more with us. So now let's forecast mortgage rates together. Let's do this as a team. Okay, what you see here on top, that is the replacement values. This is what we saw in 2022 core CPI. Every month, this will be replaced with the new numbers this year. On the bottom, this is what the shelter component. So this bottom piece is 43% of this. So this is gonna have a great influence in what this is. So as we look at what gets replaced in 2023, let's start with what we saw last week. On Valentine's Day, we got an inflation number that was going to replace a pretty high number. So that should have been good, right? But we were expecting it to be a little rocky. Why? Because if you take a look here, the shelter component was very low. And in fact, shelter came out much higher and that kept inflation kind of stubbornly high. Now we know the reason, but the media doesn't understand. It's like, ah, inflation's not coming down. We still are having persistent inflation and we didn't get a good move in, in interest rates for mortgages. So we were expecting that. But what we're gonna tell you is, take a look at when we get the February reading for 2023. That's gonna replace these readings for February of 2022. So we know that both shelter was kind of high. So it's gonna be much better than this one. So we'll get hopefully a number that doesn't pressure the numbers higher. And the overall number is kind of high. So we should on March 14th, get a pretty good move in what we see here. Now there's something else that's gonna happen on March 10th. We're gonna get the jobs number too. And the jobs number should not be as good as it was for January. If you remember the jobs number for January showed we, we created like 517,000 jobs team. I'm telling you, that was just BS, okay? There were two things that were in there. Do you know what the real jobs number was? The real jobs number was we lost 2.5 million jobs, but there's something called a seasonal adjustment that said, oh, in January, you usually use three, th 3 million jobs because people being laid off from holiday hirings, but we only lost two and a half million. So therefore we really gained 500,000. I mean, that's crazy the way that works, right? But it wasn't a real amount of jobs. It was just a journal entry. And the other thing was the unemployment rate. The unemployment rate went from 3.5 to 3.4% because of something that was an entry for what they call population control. It sounds like it should be in a sci-fi movie. So they picked up illegal workers of about 810,000 from early in 2022, but instead of accounting it towards 2022, they lumped it into January of 2023, which is the wrong thing to do. If you took that out, you would have much fewer job creations and the unemployment rate would not be 3.4, it
it would be 3.9 percent a very big difference but this is you know the way that the statistics work so we have to understand this so i think we get the number on march 10th for jobs it will definitely show a more modest rate of growth in jobs and we should get better reaction in the bond market then a few days later we get this inflation number which should be good i think mid-march you're going to see much better mortgage rates now a month later we get to april and there's a little bit of a problem here in april while the shelter component is good what do you notice about march of 2022's overall inflation it was what very wide everybody it was very low so we're going to have a hard time making progress when we get this data on april 12th so i'm a little worried that people who don't understand this in the media they're going to say oh inflation still persistent it's still there and the bond market's not going to respond very well. So we have to be on guard for that. But then I want you to circle a date in your calendar, and that's May 10th, because that's when we get the April data and where it starts to get really good. So you can see we have high numbers in both shelter and high numbers in the overall rate of inflation that will be replaced with lower numbers for April, May, and June. That starts on May 10th. So may we'll get this in june we get this one in july i think it's going to be a good summer for us folks in fact we see mortgage rates getting to around five percent maybe a little above maybe a little below but let me tell you in this tight inventory environment when you unleash all these buyers with a five percent mortgage on a tight inventory environment what's going to happen to prices the time to get into that opportunity is in advance not when everybody sees it you have to see the future before it becomes obvious and we know too many dollars creates you know inflation well the fed was printing it like crazy this is the trend of you know money supply tends to go up over time anyway but the fed with its stimulus started printing it in 2021 with quantitative easing as well as the fed putting us in a position where we had the government three big stimuluses in 2021 and 2020 but now in 2022, it started to come back. It almost never comes down. This is a record that it came down. And in by the middle of this year, this should be neutralized. So we saw it go up in 2020 and 2021 up 40%. In 2022, it was down 2%. And in January of 2023 alone, it was down 7%. By the middle of this year, it's going to go back to trend. Now, a recession is another thing. Are we in a recession? We could be, but we're certainly headed for one. So what's been postponing the recession? Well, these two things. So this shows you the balances on credit cards. So before the pandemic, we were already doing a good job of adding to balances on credit cards, but then the pandemic came, and so things got shut down. But when the pandemic hit, before we were saving 10% of our earnings, that was our personal savings rate. But then we got a giant stimulus check, and we had nothing to spend it on. So we first put it in our bank account. So we put the stimulus in our bank account, but then with nothing to spend it on and a big credit card balance, you see what happened. We used that savings to pay off our credit cards. You see how that happened? But then, guess what? We got another stimulus check. Oh, well, so now we did a little bit of shopping. Maybe get some good name brand stuff. And we spent the second stimulus a lot faster than we spent the first. But that's okay. There's another stimulus check. Boom. And we spent this one, even though it was more money, even faster. Now, since then, I guess people like the stimulus lifestyle. We like that, right? But without any more stimulus checks to keep the party going, what are we going to do? Well, I got some plastic here that I've got some big balances I could use. And we started jacking up our credit cards. And not only have we jacked up our credit cards to all-time highs, at the same time, we've drained our bank accounts. We went from 10% savings before to about 4% savings rate now. And this, unfortunately, is where we are, everybody. So this itself has an expiration to it. This cannot persist forever. And when it does, the economy hits a wall and we have that recession. So what does that mean for mortgage rates during recession? Well, mortgage rates drop. Mortgage rates come down every time during recessions. The last one, they drop by 1% more. This one, one and an eighth and more, almost 1% then more, 2% then more, 5% then more, 4%, you get the picture. So if you're asking me, Barry, you say mortgage rates are gonna get to around 5% from its current rate of a little over six, can it get there? Yes, 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 yes. But hold on a second. What happens to real estate? Wouldn't it be bad for real estate? Well, yes, you would think so. But the answer is differently. Over 70 years of data, 
nine recessions, real estate values have gone up eight out of nine. Why? Well, what happens bad in a recession? People lose their jobs. So if the unemployment rate goes up 1%, that's one and a half million people that would lose their jobs. They're probably, at least temporarily, until they find another job, not going to be in the home buying market. So you take one and a half people away, one and a half million people away. But for every drop of 1% in rate, which you're gonna get, five million people now can enter as qualified buyers. So one and a half million people leave, five million people enter, and that's why you see the market do well. So, so what happened here? What the heck happened here? And why was this such an issue? in 2007, 2008. Well, aside from the fact that the mortgage application was essentially fog up a mirror, no income, no asset, job optional, down payment, don't need one, you know, all the crazy things and low credit scores fine. It really happened with supply and demand. There was just too much supply and not enough demand. And that supply came from builders. That's where supply comes from. It's not somebody selling their home because they got to go out and buy a home. So builders, not building homes, but actually completing homes, that's what creates supply. Demand is from something called household formation. So what's that? Imagine mom, dad, and a child, they all live in one household. At some point in the time the child reaches an age, they move out and get their own place. Well, it's still the same family. It's still mom, dad, and a child, but instead of one household, they have two. So they have formed a household. So that's how you get a household formation. So as we take a look here at the last 20 years, what do we see? Here's households in blue, the households being formed, and in gold, you see builders putting up homes. So in 2004 and 2005, pretty close, right? But in 2006, look at the imbalance. Builders went crazy. They built 2 million homes. We haven't become close to that since. But at the same time, the amount of buyers, it dropped off a cliff. Households being formed came down. You see, the average age is 33 years old that somebody would move out and buy their own home. Well, what happened to the 33-year-olds in 2006? Now, some of this was masked by people buying investment properties, those easy mortgages, but by 2007, there was just way too much inventory again that was built and not enough buyers, and by 2008, you had a full-blown housing bubble. Now, if you want to know why the market's so strong, just look at this here. Too many buyers not enough homes being built. So a couple of questions here. What does the future hold, but can this situation happen again? Well, we know the data for builders because we have building permits. So you, know, you don't instantly have a house that's just suddenly built. It takes time to go through the permit process, to construct it. So we know for 2023, based on permits, even in 2024, it's gonna be in the range of about 1.4 million homes. So not 2 million, not you know 1.8 million, not these big numbers that you see here. So 1.4 million, but what about demand? Can we see a big drop like this again in households form? So let's understand this. This is a 33 year old. So why did it drop so much? Maybe 33 years before birth rates changed. So let's take a look at birth rates from 33 years ago. And here's where we are. 33 years ago, the birth rate in 1973 dropped dramatically. And then again, went flat and then moved up. Hey, that looks a lot like this, doesn't it? 33 years later, drop, drop, flat, went up. Wow, it's exactly what happened. Well, these people are born. 33 years later, they're coming, right? So what caused this? Do we know what caused this big drop in 1973? Actually, we do. All right, I'm going to give you the statistical reason. I know that today everybody's overly sensitive, so please don't be. Please understand I'm offering no opinion. I'm just giving you statistical rationale. Abortions were legalized in 1973. So you had the birth rate drop, and then obviously it takes you know 40 weeks to have a baby. So it filtered into the next year. So we got a drop, a drop, then it went flat and started to go up. And isn't it interesting? That exact same drop, drop, went flat and went up. So what about the future? What does the future hold? Well, I told you about the numbers for 2023 with building, but how about for 33 year olds. Well, we get this data from going back 33 years before 2023, that's 1990. What does the birth rates look like? Up here. So if somebody's gonna say, hey, it's a bubble because prices went up, no. Look at what the demand was back here and look at what the demand's gonna be in 2023. Okay? Very big difference, folks. And you could see it reflected 
in the vacancy rate. I mean, just look at the beautiful picture that this portrays. So you can see vacancy rates here for homes and for rentals. And at the beginning of the housing bubble, vacancy started to go up. But what happened? It was masked because now you can buy an investment property. In fact, remember in the big short where the, the, the go-go dancer had five homes and a condo? Remember, people were just playing the real estate game and just buying investment properties, even though they couldn't qualify, hoping they could flip it and it could go up. They weren't buying it for them to live in. They were buying them as investments that nobody was renting. As you could see, the rental vacancy rates were going up too. So this was a problem. Today, vacancies are at an all-time low. So very big difference in the marketplace, folks. So we can't say, okay, well, just because prices went up, it's a bubble. No, there was investor properties, easy mortgages, too much supply, not enough demand, and it's reflected by high vacancy. This is reflecting the shortage in supply. But of course, the media gets out there and they want to scare you because that's what sells. So people like Dana Olick for many years on CNBC, like for example, will tell you bad stuff. And they do that today, every single chance they get. Fortunately, we can go back, thanks to the internet, and we could pull some of the old headlines. So eight years ago, she said, hey, we're in a housing bubble larger than 2006. Now, home values pretty much went straight up. But she said, you're in a housing bubble bigger than 2006 back eight years ago. And that year, prices went up. So the next year, did she say, I'm sorry I, that you missed out and I was wrong? No, she just says, hey, we're in a new housing bubble. And prices went up again. So the next year, she says, uh, home ownership doesn't build wealth. Can you show me the one person in the last six years who didn't build wealth in home ownership? And that one year, prices went up again. So the next year, she says, um, it's better to rent than to buy in today's market. So for the last five years, can you point to one person who said, oh, thank goodness I didn't buy five years ago. I'm so happy I've been renting, throwing my money away, and missing out all that appreciation. No, it's wrong again. Prices went up that year. In the middle of 2019, she said, before you buy your next home, think twice. I'm putting out a special feature. And what did she say? She said that the housing market is about to shift in a bad way. Well, it didn't shift in a bad way. Prices went up again. At the end of 2019, she said, do not buy rent because 2020 is going to be a bad year for housing. It's going to be a very hard year for housing. It was only hard if you didn't buy because prices went up 16%. And then a year and a half ago, she says, hey, the housing boom is over, except home values have gone up 18% since then and about 10% in the last year. Yes, it is true. For the past three months, home values have come down a little bit, but not much just 3%, but that's about to change and I will show you why. So, people that talk about housing bubble, let's look at inventory. During the housing bubble, you had 4 million units for sale, today less than a million, and our population's grown by 30 million people. So 30 million more people fighting for 3 million fewer homes. But even when you talk about 970,000 homes for sale, doesn't tell you the full story because of those, it includes ones that are currently under contract and closing. Right. So these are not really available. You know what's available? True inventory is active listings of only 626,000. 626,000 is half the norm, half of what's normal with more people. Uh oh, but they're going to talk about foreclosures. Watch out. They say in 2022, foreclosures were up more than 150 percent. That sounds bad, except in 2021, you couldn't do foreclosures for most of the year because of moratoriums. The same thing with 2020. When you compare it to a normal year like 2018, 2019, will they tell you it's less than half? Will they tell you it's down 95% from when the housing bubble? No. Will they tell you that 58% of a home's value today is equity and only 42% is mortgage? And back in 2008, only 19% equity, 81% mortgage. Will they tell you that? No, because that doesn't sell. Fear sells. Now, here's a big one to understand is that's affordability. Now, affordability is critical because... This is something the media harps on, and it's very easy to misunderstand. I want you to follow me on this carefully. Sometime in 2021, if you were going to buy a home with a $400,000 mortgage, say the rate was 3.5%, your payment was, let's call it $1,800. Now, a year later, values went up 10%. So that means you need to borrow 10% more. So your mortgage is now bigger, 440. So that's probably going to cost more. And rates are higher today, right? They're at six and a quarter. So that's $913 a month more, which is telling you, hey, you know what? Uh, it's less affordable. And I get that, but that's where they stop. But what they also should be talking to you about is what was the income here? Well, we have good data on that. According to Fannie Mae, the qualifying income is one thing, but the actual income was about $9,000 a month. I think two income earners earning $50,000 a year. 
But we know that from ADP, the payroll company, that incomes have gone up 7.3%, which tells you that their income went up $657 a month. Now, it's not quite the difference here, but it's eating into it, except, uh-oh, inflation. Food, gas, other things, that's making it cost more. So it's costing us 1200 bucks a month more. We're making 657 more. It truly is less affordable by $556 a month. But the thing is, folks, is that when we look at this, this is a snapshot. You know, the great Wayne Gretzky, he didn't go to where the puck was. He went to where the puck was going. So where is the puck going here? Well, we know that this is kind of fixed right now because if you took out your mortgage, it's fixed. But what about your income? Now, ADP says it's going up over 7%. The Atlanta Fed says it's going to go up 6.7%. The Bureau of Labor Statistics says 5.4%. So let's be very conservative. Let's say it only goes up 5%. That would mean your income would go up another 5%. So now your monthly income is $10,140. That's an increase of $483. And when you compare it to what the payment increase was with inflation and interest rates, it's a little less affordable, but not much. Except for one thing. What if we're right on mortgage rates? And I believe we will be. Where will mortgage rates be? Let's call it 5%. You can make a mathematical argument that it will be more affordable over the summer of 2023 than it was in 2021. And you know what happened in 2021. So what's our housing forecast? Lower inflation. We believe that. We see that coming. We showed that to you. Recession-like slowdown. We know that's coming. Incomes are increasing. I just showed you the affordability. You know inventory is tight. And are rents any kind of picnic? <laughs> rents are tight too. They're expensive. They're rising. They're no picnic. So what do we see? Low single digit appreciation. Now, is that a big deal? Let's think about it. What if it's three or 4%? Heck, let's just say 3% appreciation. Well, today you can get a little bit of a discount. So I could actually save 2% today. So if I save 2% and then get 3% appreciation over the next year, that's a total of 5% difference. 5% on a $500,000 home, that's $25,000. How long does it take your customer? after you take their income, minus taxes, minus mortgage, minus car payments, minus food, credit card payments, giving their kids money to save money. Maybe they're lucky they could save 2,000, 3,000 bucks a year if they don't go negative. Take them 10 years to save $25,000. You get to help them save it over the next six to 12 months. And that's a perfect opportunity. Look, a year ago, I got to give you $50,000 over asking price. I can't even get a home inspection. But today I get a little negotiation at 2%, right? So think about the benefit there. So 2% on a $500,000 home, that's a $10,000 savings, but hold on a second. Don't take the price reduction. You heard me right, don't take the price reduction. You need to talk to your guaranteed rate affiliate to help you show why this is such a huge opportunity in housing right now. Because instead of a price reduction, take it as a contribution towards closing costs. But the seller, they don't care, it's still $10,000. But when you take it as a contribution towards closing costs, you can do something like a 2-1 buy-down. Now, that 2-1 buy-down will cost about $9,000. That gives you 1000 to use towards closing costs. So, hey, less cash at closing that you need. But now I'm going to save 500 bucks a month. And I'm going to get a rate of 4.25%. Now, that's only for the first year. It'll go to 5 and a quarter, then 6 and a quarter. But rates are going to come down. You could refinance it. If you refinance 6 months, 8 months, 12 months from now, you take the unused portion of this buy-down, that three, four, five thousand dollars $5,000, and it'll more than pay for your closing costs. It'll leave you some extra money on top of it too. So hold on. I get the home of my dreams today. I get it at a discount today. I save 500 bucks today. I get a great rate. I refinance it to a great rate. It doesn't cost me anything to refinance. I even get some more money back. And then I sit back and watch as when everybody discovers what I'm discovering already, that there's more buyers that are going to come to the market in a 5% environment with tight inventory and prices start going up. I've gotten in on the ground floor. Or here's something else. I can use that $10,000 or whatever that 2% reduction is towards taking a permanent buy down. That means buying the rate down with points. You can disproportionately take advantage of this in this particular environment. Ask your guaranteed rate affiliate how. They will, your loan officer how. Here's what they will do. They can get that rate down to a very low level. It's going to still save about 250 bucks a month, but here's the magic of it. 
look, how many of you are out there? I know it's not uncommon for you to be working with someone in tight inventory environment for four or five, six months. When you first started with them, rates were lower. So they were qualified for a more expensive home. Now the rates have gone up. All of a sudden they can't qualify for as much, but you can't unring a bell. Their eyes have seen it. Their heart has become attached to that more expensive home. So they're not as engaged right now. They're not as, as, as motivated right now because they feel like they have to settle. Well, guess what? Guaranteed rate of finish, your LO can show you how you can use this seller contribution to bring the rate down. And in this example, still save them 250 a month and qualify for $50,000 more home. They could still get the home of their dreams today that they really wanted to get. So you can solve those problems. And they could show them. Your guaranteed rate loan officer has the ability to show them mathematically that the price break will always be the worst choice. The seller contribution shows with a 2-1 buy down, the payment's cheaper for the first two and a half years. After that, the permanent buy down. Even if you sold your home, if you sold your home for the first year and a half, it's the 2-1 buy down. Yes, there is a period of time, just for six months, between months 18 and 24, the price break would be a little bit better, but then two years and beyond, the permanent buy down's always better. Don't take the price break. Use it for a seller contribution. Now, some people are gonna think about renting, right? So should I rent? and wait it out. Well, let's use an example, $400,000 purchase price, 10% down is a 360 mortgage. Let's pick a rate of six and a half, but let's make it worse. Let's say they never refinance. I'm telling you, rates are gonna come to 5%, but they, they forget to refinance. So I'm gonna use that example, and they're there for nine years with a six and a half percent rate. But let's talk about all the things when you're renting versus ownership, the things that are negative about home ownership. If I'm renting, I don't have to worry about my taxes going up, so let's figure your taxes going up. Also, if I'm renting, I don't have to worry about repairs because my landlord pits. So let's count repair costs as something. And then I have to figure out how I'm going to sell my home. So it's 6% cost, not of today's value, but of the appreciated value. And for the last 63 years, homes are going up at four and three quarters. Now let's make the rent even better. Below market, only 2,900 bucks a month to rent this place. And rents only go up at 4% a year. Historical average is five to six. Should I buy a rent? Well, you might say, well, if you look at monthly payment, rent's $500 a month cheaper. It's a no-brainer, right? Well, not so, because over time, the rent not only goes up over time, it actually becomes more expensive to rent. But remember, the principal portion of your payment should be considered because that's not a cost. That's your own money that's being put into equity in the home. It's like a forced savings account. And it's a lot. It's $47,600. This is something that nobody talks to their customers about. That's the principal portion. So the rent's not cheaper. You're spending more, but the money's your own that you're putting in a forced savings account in equity. And what about appreciation? Well, yeah, four and three quarter percent is historical. It should go up in the future, but let's just go with the historical average. It's hard to figure it out. Four and three quarters on 400,000 compounded annually for nine years. It's, it's hard. That's why Albert Einstein said it's the eighth wonder of the world. And you know what? It really is because that appreciation of just four and three quarter percent is $207,000. Now look, if that home today is 400, nine years from now it'll be worth 607. So I got to sell it 6% of 607. That cost me 36,000, but I do get a tax break. I'm better off by $216,000. And remember that's counting everything in there. And that's saying the rent's below market. It doesn't go as much as the market amount and that you never refinance from six and a half. The real number should be over $300,000 better. But we're just saying all those negatives and I'm still $216,000 better. And look, each year it's better except for year one. So here's the truth. If you're gonna be there le you know, less than two years, rent. Because the cost to get in and the cost to get out will outweigh the benefits. But if you're there two years or more, why in the world are you not buying this home? Why, because you don't like the way 6% sounds? Do you like the way $216,000 sounds? Your guaranteed rate affiliate can co-brand this with you and arm you with this information, and it's critical that you do. Look, in net worth, we all want net worth. You want to be in the top 1% in net worth in the United States, you need $10.8 million. The top 2%, you need $2.5 million. This is according to a study from Kiplinger's that was recently released. The top 5%, pretty exclusive club, you need a million dollars net worth. The top 10%, 800,000. That's pretty good. The top 10% is pretty good to be in. And if you want to be in the top half, you need a half a million dollars net worth. But also the study said, on average, two thirds of all net worth came from, you guessed it, home equity. Bottom line, you can't get rich being a renter. You can't get rich listening to the media's garbage 
and avoid real estate. Over time, real estate creates net worth, two thirds of it. So you have to be in this. And AVMs are very important. Imagine bringing an AVM to a listing appointment and saying, hey, this is where we are on, on your neighborhood, every valuation. Here's where the subject property is. Here's what the appraised value is. You don't want to go to Zillow for this stuff because then they're going to hawk them with their realtors too. So your guaranteed rate loan officer can help you with this, show you all the comps, give you market trends, where they're located on a map. This is what you can be able to present at a listing. And they can also give you a real estate report card, which if you're not using this, you're crazy. Okay, really, who doesn't want to know this? What's the last 63 years average appreciation in this zip code? In the zip code, what's it for the last 10 years, five years? And what's the forecast for the next one and five years? How much is the home value going to go up? What's household formations? How, how much permits are out there? What's the rental situation? What's the age demographics, inventory, unemployment, incomes in my market, jobs, affordability, everything you want to know, they do it for you. You know, there's a great line in the book, The Art of War by Sun Tzu which says every battle is won or lost before it's ever fought. Are you winning the battle before you fight it as a real estate agent? When you go to a listing appointment, are you saying, let's take a look at an actual appraisal and every house in the neighborhood and seeing what it goes for? Are you saying, let's take a look at what this pro property would rent for? And also let's do a real estate report card and say, not only do I want to present this to you at a listing, I want to show every prospective buyer this opportunity. This is what I'm going to use on social media. This is what's going to be in every open house. All it takes is just a phone call to your guaranteed rate affiliate loan officer, affinity loan officer, and what they are going to do for you is in seconds create this incredible, incredible package for you. Look, the time of maximum pessimism is the best time to buy. That's a quote from Sir John Templeton, the greatest investment mind in the world in history. Well. I've got to tell you that right now there's a lot of pessimism. This is a great time to buy. Now, articles like this are going to be out there from American bankers, a time to quit mortgage and real estate. Everything in this article was true. Real estate transactions down 40%. Refinances down 80%. Yeah, everything's true. One thing I did not tell you about the article, it was written in 2014. That's right. Very similar market. And if you quit, if you kind of leaned away from the market in 2014, you missed the greatest eight year run in history of real estate and mortgage. Don't you dare lean out. Don't you dare think about getting scared or quitting. I don't know what the next eight years has, but I do know this, there's good news. It's right around the corner and there is a huge amount of opportunity. I wrote a book about it that many of you were kind enough to purchase, make it a number one bestseller on Amazon called Money in the Streets, all about finding those opportunities and inspiration there. Now, if you want to stay in touch with me, you should either capture this with your phone and use this QR code, or you can go to Instagram, I am Barry Habib. And the reason why you should is because if you like some of the stuff we talked about, I have a lot of content there, all 30 second videos that you could take it, you could steal it, you could repost it. Please be my guest and use it to bring the point home for your customer. If you want your customer to see what oh, I just talked to you about and kind of hear it in my voice, take it use it just follow me on instagram and take it away and uh frank i know that uh we are two minutes over time but um i wanted to make sure we got all that in so uh thank you so much everyone i appreciate your uh, your incredible time and uh, paying attention and, and spending with me i hope that you enjoyed it and god bless you all i hope that this was worthwhile for you and and i'm wishing you tons of success Agreed. Yeah, Barry, thank you so much, everyone, for attending. Uh, we really thank you. Uh, this has been a great hour, and uh, we're looking at uh, getting Barry uh, right around the next Fed announcement uh, in uh, in mid-May. So please stay tuned for more details I, I, actually, on that. Yeah, actually, the, the next Fed announcement is going to be March 22nd. They're probably going to hike again. But remember, it's not so much that. It's those inflation dates I gave you. March 14th should be good. The jobs number March 10th should be weaker. So that's going to be good. April 12th, be a little rocky, Frank, for, for that. But then May 10th, put that in your calendar because good news will start to happen. Rates are going to come down. Buyers are going to flood in and value is going to be well supported. Put it in your calendar, May 10th. I got a video on it on my Instagram. You can take it, use it, steal it, uh, be my guest. Uh, is there any questions that you want me to answer? I know we're three minutes or four minutes over, but I'm happy to answer any questions for people that are out there. 
Yeah, you know, while some questions are coming in, I actually have a couple of things here. Um, first time home buyers is going to be a, a massive part of this segment going into the spring market and summer. Um, if your loan officer is not talking about AMI, please write that down, AMI. Go to your guaranteed rate affinity loan officer. They're going to show you how you can get your borrowers to take advantage of A is an apple, M is an Mary, I is an in income. It stands for annual median income. Make sure that you know that. Go to your guaranteed rate affinity loan officer, and they're going to explain to you how that program is going to help you get more of your buyers into that house. Um, so let's see if we can pick out some questions here. Lots of thank yous. Great information, fantastic information. Uh, it looks like the questions that have been asked have been answered. So everyone, Barry, we'll let you go. Thank you again so much. And everyone else, have a great rest of your day. Have a great week. And uh, here's a great spring market. All right, everyone. Thank, thank you. you. Got your eyes on a home? You need local home loan experts. You need Guaranteed Rate Affinity. We've made your way home simple and seamless with the best technology designed to get you home fast. Like closed in as fast as 10 days fast. Ready? Talk to your Coldwell Banker Realty agent and your Guaranteed Rate Affinity Loan Officer will get you on the fast track.